Yeah, yeah, I right. can see him. Excellent. We still have a little bit of time, so let's wait a couple of minutes. And you have uh, Wi-Fi, right? What Raymond is uh, uh, not at home at the moment. Is it okay? Kind of spotty, but I'll do my best. Okay. And we will uh, we will uh, project your uh, slides. Sure. Oh, okay. And you you just ask for next one. Can you read them? Can you see them? You will I just say next slide, them. please. Sure. No problem. Can you see them in your computer? You have oh, a laptop. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, not a lot of people know this, but Ray was a FAPA intern. I knew him when he was this tall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Wait, which year was that again, Ray? So no, what when I introduced you, that's the right facts and figures. 1995, maybe? Something like that, right? I'm really, wow. Yeah, and awesome. were you what, like 17, 18? No, I think it was closer to 15, honestly. Really? <laughs> so too. Wow, yeah. we accept the internet at that age? Wow. It was a special little special occasion. <laughs> nice. Special exception. To preserve authoritarian And so in other words, the demand for this type of thing. Who's that? Yeah. Oh, Julia. Is that Julia Chu? Yeah, I think she, she muted herself after that. Right, Kun, I cannot see the slides. Uh, they're not there yet. yet. We are not sharing okay. yet. We are not sharing no yet. You want to test, uh, Cosette? Uh, I can. I can do that. Or uh, Janelle? Yeah, yeah, share it and see what happens. Yeah, just try to share and see if that works. Hi, Chao Jin. Hey, Chao oh, Excellent. Uh, so works, right? Janelle can do. Yeah, full screen. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Can you see perfect. them, right? Yeah, I can. Okay, okay, good. That's good. How good. many are there? How many slides? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, but I'll get through them very quickly. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So I think Janelle, uh, let's uh, let's stop sharing so we can see yeah. people. Thank you. All right. Janelle, I, I try to use the background you gave me that you are doing, <laughs> but it's kind of for me. I see it reverse, so I didn't use it. That's that's normal. So from your perspective, it will be reversed. But from others, oh, really? it will be the right direction. <laughs> okay, that's really yeah weird. It's okay. a bit odd. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You want to try? Means so, to. your background was uh, is homemade or it's uh, what? Oh, I made that. Yeah, yeah, no, it looks good. Yeah, it looks I good. put that in the uh, the turkey package last year. <laughs> Oh, so you can do it. Anybody yeah. can do it. Oh, yeah, say, yeah anybody can easy. change that. Yeah. Oh, all right. You that's can, good you, idea. Yeah, you can change your virtual background. And I can send you this picture again. All right. Would you please? Yes. I so we have, all have the same background. Right? <laughs> oh, so means also use it. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I I get I send you email. I, you didn't in this form. Gary, hey, okay, Gary. Oh, Gary is here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, hello. Hey, hello. Yeah. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see Everybody. you. Everybody, wow. Yeah, wow. It's, okay. it's great. Gary, you, you Both is here. Huh? <laughs> and there's my mom. Okay. <laughs> oh, your mom is here too. Yeah. <laughs> Who That's is why we have so many away. people. Anybody from Taiwan logging in? Taiwan. Well, Taiwan right now is uh, three o'clock at midnight. Yeah, midnight. well, some FAPA members are very determined, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Get it, Chachu? Yeah, it was uh, Chachu's there. No, Chachu called the fly. I saw it happening here. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> In midair. <laughs> Get it? You got it? So, who is your mother, Ray? Let me uh, introduce her. Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's like a little quo family reunion. 
Exactly. It is. So we have Jenny here. Is our intern Jenny? Hello. Hi, Jenny. Okay. I just send you the email, President Ouyang, and you will see in your inbox. With the background? Oh, yeah, I got yeah, it already. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, Tom. Thomas. Oh, hey, Thomas. Oh, I Thomas. got a little bit difficult to sign in. So, uh, what was come up with the whiteboard and, and get, get through a lot of procedure. Oh, really? Okay. At least right now, I get, re I, I, I get it through right now. You got it? You're in great yeah. shape. Good. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. In, in time. You. In, oh, one minute late. <laughs> Thomas, you, Thomas, you have to pour some coffee into machine. That re will really help I, you. I know? think so. I heard, you, I heard you say somebody so dedicated from Taiwan, even to your class, and nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, Gary. I uh, see you, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, been a while. Yeah, right. Mm, I see Sue Kuo is there too. Hey, Gary. You have, you hey, have your Hello, you Sue. have your kitchen in your background. So, are you cooking uh, something? Is that a kitchen? No, actually, I'm in a study room. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I cook and I work. Always. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Garrett can host this event. Yeah. Oh, no. Right. <laughs> I'm on vacation, you know. I'm retired, so oh. I have to let these young people do all the work. <laughs> like me. Right, right, Thomas? I mean, right. we are retired, right? <laughs> Many years. But I, I was wondering how long you've been retired. You've been retired so many times, so I don't know even how, how to count your retirement. <laughs> Well, Almost ten which, years, right? Which which retirement are you talking about? From that's the right, exactly. Me, from twenty the, years already. <laughs> from the Dutch government or from FAPA or? <laughs> oh, from the latest one is from the university. No, I'm still teaching. Actually, I so still te so how teach. So can you say you are retired? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my third retirement. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. But you, you left up on 2014, right, Garrett? Oh, 2016. Oh, 16. 16. Yeah. So like still no, not long ago. ago. Not long ago. Kun, you are getting old. You are starting to forget <laughs> things. I know. I'm bad with numbers now. <laughs> I hardly remember my own age. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. That's uh... So, how many people sign in right now? How many? Yeah, not too many. How can we see one on the uh, list? We have uh, 31, it looks like. Oh, 31. Yeah. Some maybe count two times, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm afraid to touch the board because uh, when I touch it, it might go away. I typically come back, so. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not familiar to how to use it, so. Ray, where are you now? You're in, um, skiing, right? Well, my my kids and my wife are skiing. I I don't like skiing. <laughs> <laughs> but in, are you in the in uh, North Shore? North Shore of uh, Lake Superior. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can uh, you like, you know. Can you show the picture outside? Do you, how much snow do you have? <laughs> oh, we only got we only got eighteen inches last week. It wasn't that bad. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, only eighteen. <laughs> yeah. That's why I don't go. Skiing. In Colorado, in Colorado, we have nice day, but uh, it's uh, only thirty degree. Uh -huh. Very how much, cold. How much snow do you have in Colorado? Oh, it's the sunshine. No snow at all. No snow That's in Colorado? Cool. Goodness. That's weird. 30 degrees. 30 yeah. degrees. They have snow all over in California, right? Who is from California? They have snow. Yeah. Yeah, May is here, but she says no snow in uh, Northern California. Oh, okay. Yeah, only in, only in the south. Big snow, I saw. Only on Southern California snow. Good goodness. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, North, North California, they got some snow too. My Pearl. children 
live there. Hi. My Hi. children live there. They, they are very well exciting to, to, to play snow. Where, 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 which, part of snow? which part Which part of California? California? Huh? Atoga, uh, uh, Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Bay Area, Bay Area is snow. Yeah. Oh, snow, no yeah. snow here. Very strange, huh? Too sad. <laughs> uh, I always feel that the FAPA virtual meetings are almost like a family reunion, <laughs> party time. <laughs> get a beer and just keep chatting but i think we should get started and um i will mc the whole thing but let me first ask Minza to welcome everybody and what uh, we plan to do is first let Minza will welcome everybody i will introduce ray then we uh, go uh, ray has a slideshow and then we have some questions that we received online and I also would like to invite all of you to, you know, ask questions. Uh, Ray is very knowledgeable. He um, has, uh, you know, a long history of Taiwan involvement. But let me first ask uh, means to officially open this meeting and to welcome everybody. Okay, thanks, Colin. Um, first, I want to thank everyone. This is a, actually outside is very, very pretty. So uh, we said <laughs> yeah, today, it's a uh, day. yeah, it's a beautiful day and we are gathering here. I really want to thank everyone joining us and this is great. And we also have our staff, uh, all, almost everyone participated in this call. And I want to thank uh, our speaker, Raymond, and uh, taking his time, uh, speed, busy schedule in the weekend to give us this talk. This is very uh, interesting hot topic. I think we all are concerned as a Taiwanese. So uh, thank you. I want to recognize, uh, uh, I mean, let, let me introduce uh, Kun first. Kun, I, I think everybody know. Uh, he is our uh, um, executive director for FAPER and then the senior advisor uh, in, in the FAPA. And we have uh, uh, Cassette. Uh, said it's our operations manager, huh? and so uh, we have uh, Janelle. Janelle is doing everything now, right? <laughs> so she's like uh, in charge of uh, all the our events and our uh, many many things, and also communication and and coordinating everything. Sorry, Min. Min sorry, you kind of muted. Me, I'm gonna get. Yeah, I, I my computer take over. Somebody. Uh, maybe right. the chat OPT uh, uh, GPD is taking over my my computer or something like right. that. Yeah, it's just uh, all of a sudden it, it muted myself. Okay, yeah. your speech is much more beautiful now. <laughs> See, it's a, it's a technology, right? You need AI every day. Yeah. Um, so that's great. Uh, I uh, Janelle will will actually uh, help us uh, during our uh, March for uh, May first our banquet in Taipei, Taiwan to celebrate the 40th anniversary uh, for FAPA in Taiwan. Uh, and I just want to uh, take this moment to welcome everyone. If you can join us there in Taipei. May 1st. Uh, May 1st is a Monday. And uh, yeah, well, so, uh, so she, she, she's, uh, she's help, helping everything. And actually, Cassette will be with us going through her trip. <laughs> but uh, Janelle will handle a lot of things with, for this event. And uh, we have also Jenny with us. Uh, Jenny is Jenny Lee. She's our current intern and uh, she's uh, uh, studying in the Columbia University, right? Um, thank you. I don't want to, I think it's enough. Uh, thank you, everyone. Let's uh, have the event started. And may, I, may I know, do, do we have, <laughs> I keep asking, do you have any activity after the banquet? Uh, you, uh, you will discuss in the upcoming. Uh, standing committee meeting in Los Angeles. So after that, we'll have, we are going to announce our plan. Okay. Uh, when, when is it? Uh, that's the next weekend. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Back to you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, means And thank you everybody for uh, joining. I think some more people will uh, gradually come in and join us, but uh, I think we should go get started. We're uh, 
very special occasion that Ray is with us today, as um, we were already talking about. He was an intern with FAPA when he was 13 years old. Ray? <laughs> Ray, how old were you when you were an intern? I think 15. Oh, 15, not 13. <laughs> Not that close enough. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> and he was uh, very smart, I remember that. Although he, he was like only this tall, but he was very smart. And I remember that uh, he was a very good writer. And do you remember that at some point we, uh, I, I asked you to write a little bit more like paragraph wise, but you had that really American style Reuters. <laughs> you know, style, AP style of writing. And I thought later, I thought I shouldn't have asked you to write my style because you had the right style. So, you know, 30 years later, I just think I uh, just want to get that off my chest that I've been waiting <laughs> to do that for 30 years. So you were the better writer and well, probably I, still are. I, I highly doubt that. <laughs> but uh, so Ray, uh, from the uh, bio that we sent with the... Uh, that we linked with the invitation. He is at the moment with Rand Corporation. Uh, he, he's a very knowledgeable international security. Um, you know, we always hope that we have contributed to a little bit to his career path by planting a seed when he was for 15 years old already. In, uh, and of course, his mother is Sue Kuo, who is also here, who is a long time uh, Taiwanese American uh, activist and uh, whose brother in law is my compatriot Garrett Vanderwees, who is also here. And so Ray is nephew of Garrett and Machin. Is that correct, Garrett? <laughs> Yeah, so which I think is very interesting that he uh, was a professor at Fordham University in New York, University of Albany, SUNY, S-U-N-Y, worked for the United Nations, National Democratic Institute, and the Democratic Progressive Party. And you you were a spokesperson or something, right, uh, Ray? Well, was that just, or a, just, just a, anything? Yeah. Just the hand. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, I'm, I really look forward to hearing from you. Um, we ask you with the anniversary of the start of the war in Ukraine to first talk a bit about that. I think that's important. It's a devastating war. Um, it, it's, of course, has implications for the way we look at Taiwan. And so I hope to first hear, hear from that. And then afterwards, you and I talked a little bit and you did a big article about strategic ambiguity. So we want to hear a little bit about that. And I think we will then also go over multiple issues that FAPA at the moment is working on. And we hope that you will lend your views and expertise like diplomatic relations, techro name change. Mm. And you and I already communicated about that. So, and, and if anybody has questions, you can submit them to uh, in the chat box. And we have received a couple of questions also, so we will put them uh, at some point on the screen. But let's first start by giving uh, Ray a round of applause, you know, because he is uh, on holidays, but still took some time to uh, join us. So thank you very much, Ray. And uh, let's start the uh, program and warm welcome. And then we start the program and with a slideshow. Thank you all for joining. And I feel, Ray, if that's okay with you, that people can raise their hand. Oh, yeah. In, in, in between your presentation, even. You know, we're a relatively small group. And so we, uh, if anybody needs clarification or wants to add something, feel free to do that at uh, everybody's own discretion. Sounds great. All right, Janelle, thanks. Put the first slide on the screen. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, it, it's great to be back at Papa. Uh, so um, today I'll be discussing Ukraine and kind of giving my scorecard for the various countries and how well they've done. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so we're going to look at, you know, what's Ukraine done mostly right, what's Russia done mostly wrong, and what the U.S. has done right and wrong. And then um, kind of wrapping up the last two points, what are the lessons from this war for Taiwan and what can you as FAPA board members do, uh, as FAPA members do? Uh, next slide. 
So the main takeaways are that Ukraine is a great model for Taiwan, for how Taiwan could defend itself. But the issue is that we have to start getting to work. Um, China is going to be much more difficult to beat than Russia, and U.S. support and coordination are essential. And that's, I think, chiefly where uh, FAPA members can help out. Uh, next slide. Okay. So if we think back Don't to... take a look? Can we mute ourselves, uh, please? Or can you do that, Janelle? All right, so if we think back to the pre-war expectation, before, you know, um, let's say January, February of 2020, 2022, wow. Um, you know, the expectation was that Russia was just gonna stop all over Ukraine. If you look at this, this uh, graphic here, the red lines represent Russia's forces, the yellow ones represent Ukraine's forces. And you just see that, you know, Russia has way more uh, personnel, uh, tanks, aircraft, way more than, than, um, than, than the Ukrainians do. Uh, next slide, please. Also, on top of that, you know, Ukraine wanted to project itself as fighting a fundamentally defensive war. And that means it couldn't really go on the attack. It, you know, as Russia surrounded all of Ukraine here with forces in Belarus, all along the northeast to east to southeast border, uh, even also from Crimea, you know, it looked like Russia was just going to sweep in and from every possible direction. Next slide. And it'd be a repeat of the 2014 invasion of Crimea, where 70% of Ukrainian forces actually surrendered and swore allegiance to Moscow. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians suffered about 10,000 casualties, and the expectation was uh, if Russia is intent on taking over Ukraine, it was just going to wipe the floor with Ukraine and take it all over. Next slide. But that's, of course, not what happened at all. Here we have the remains of a T -6, T-72 T tank turret. Is it? Uh, which looks nice like a, like a skull. So we have to ask ourselves, what actually happened? Next slide. And for that, we have to ask, what has Ukraine done right? Uh, next slide. First off, they took the threat seriously. They were able to galvanize foreign support, and they had a clear theory of victory. Uh, next slide. So in 2014, uh, Russia took over Crimea and little green men, you know, quote unquote, little green men started showing up all over the place. They were not wearing any flags or badges. They took over strategic locations. <laughs> and next slide. Um, they ended up carving off uh, these uh, the provinces here in pink, uh, the easternmost provinces and Crimea. And ironically enough, that was actually the most pro-Russian parts of Ukraine. So in cutting off those areas, it actually made it easier for Ukraine to coalesce against the threat because they don't have to worry about these sort of third parties or other parties in, in, in uh, Ukraine trying to, trying to undermine them. Uh, it was a wake-up call, too, for Ukraine. It gave, by Russia taking over Crimea, taking over the Donbass, it gave the Ukrainians eight years of preparation time to get ready for the next upcoming fight. Next slide. And they very much did. Um, in 2014, uh, uh, the author here, Liam Collins, he's the... Uh, Colonel, I think he might still be a colonel, um, <clears throat> uh, head of the Modern War Institute, also a PhD. I, I knew him when we were at Princeton together. Uh, he was one of the integral, uh, integral people who got the Ukrainians to prepare, uh, increasing the defense budget, pushing the initiative, military initiative, down to lower echelons, uh, professionalizing the officer corps, updating equipment, um, getting ready to hit that reset button on their military and actually defend themselves. Next slide. Oh, actually. Here are all the corrections, the, uh, the, the, the corrections they did right here. So defense budget, professionalization training, and updating their equipment. Next slide. And in terms of the defense budget, we can see that starting in 2015, oh, you can't see me, I don't think, uh, <clears throat> there was this big jump, this big increase in terms of the uh, military spending uh, as compared to GDP. Uh, next slide. You've got training that happened within the United States. There's a, there's a story from the early days of the war where a Ukrainian soldier was unable to use his Javelin anti-tank missile. Next slide. And so he called up uh, using WhatsApp a friend of his uh, while he was in deployment in Washington State and said, hey, I can't get this thing to work. Can you help me out? And he's like, sure. So a guy in Washington State gave live text support to a, a soldier in Ukraine who was able to fire off the missile and kill a tank using this particular weapon system right here. And so, uh, next slide. So by 2022, Ukraine had a professional military force. It had effective leadership in the form of uh, uh, Zelensky, President Zelensky, next slide. Um, <laughs> where, you know, 
it was pretty iconic, right? He said, like, no, the fight is here. And he, he received a call from the State Department asking, like, do you want us to evacuate the, you? He's like, no, the fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. And that sort of leadership uh, kind of was not just the strategic political level, but also has kind of burned down into the lower echelon levels in the military, where the sergeants, the lieutenants, they're taking the initiative, they're taking the fight to the Russians. Next slide. And lastly, uh, this was a matter of organization, getting themselves ready, because the Ukrainians knew that if a war was going to happen, it would require a whole of nation effort to, uh, to, to accomplish. Uh, next slide. It was going to require men, and then uh, the next slide would be... Um, Next slide, please. Uh, women that they had there who signed up, um, the woman in the center there, she was a school teacher. Um, the New York Times followed her after a year and found that she had been fighting all over the front. Um, and then the next slide. <clears throat> Even the elderly were fighting and listening to fight. This guy was 80 years old. Uh, that little that brown bag he had, he carried a change of clothes and two sandwiches. And he said, hand me a gun, I'm going to fight for my country. Yeah, I remember uh, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, next slide, after, please. And so the Ukrainians took that threat seriously. And because they took the threat seriously, they were able to galvanize foreign support. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, you had protests and public, you know, I guess, pro demonstrations in support of Ukraine in, you know, Times Square and all across the world. Next slide. As a result of that, <clears throat> uh, the Western powers, include in, in, when I say Western, I also include like Japan, Australia, South Korea, they imposed a whole variety of sanctions on Russia that really cratered the Russian economy. It looks okay right now, but it's going to take them decades to recover from this. Uh, next slide, please. And then lastly on this, they've also launched anti-corruption drives to say that, look, we are a country that you can believe in. We are not going to misuse the funding that you're, you're doing. We, you, can, you can trust us to, to effectively use the, the resources and material that you've been sending to us in, in an a upright and honest way. So next slide. So for the Ukrainians, they overall get an A, at least according to me. They've <clears throat> they effectively understood the threat, they prepared for the threat, and they executed that uh, their their strategic plans on the battlefield exceptionally well. Next slide, please. So let's think about Russia. What has Russia done right or wrong? And you know, to give a bit of a preview, it's going to be mostly wrong. Uh, next slide. So. The roots of where Russia did things wrong mostly come down to their pol internal political structure. They have a personalistic dictatorship system where everything comes down to one person, Vladimir Putin. Next slide. So when we think about democracies, ooh, that didn't show up. Um, political competition within democracies, between political parties, between politicians, usually that means a few things. Um, your policies are more aligned with the electorate. Uh, the citizens are the ones who vote for you, you have to appeal to them. Um, you need to have better information about what the electorate actually wants. So, you know, it's all well and good if you have yes men, but you actually need accurate information and you want to create institutions that will seek out that information. And because of that, there's a way for democracies to moderate their policies. They tend to take the policies that aim towards the middle, and they can also change their policies much more easily. You know, well, if you know, one president gets, uh, uh, gets voted out, the next one can come in and change whatever policies he or she wants. Next slide, please. Party, uh, back one up. So party-led authoritarian systems. <clears throat> um, you can think about the CCP in China. They tend to have some of this internal party competition as well. You have alignment with what we call selectorate, the CCP members. They get some feedback on performance, and because they had to balance the different interests, they get, to some extent, they get some moderation. Next slide, please. But that's not what you see in a personalistic dictatorship. There, the dictator is the person that decides. There's nobody else. It's Vladimir Putin sitting here alone, paranoid, afraid, and isolated. Next slide. <clears throat> and so what happens if you are a person in the system? Well, you don't want to piss off the big guy. You end up being more of yes men. So, uh, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin may not have understood, and you get bad information because all you're listening to, all the dictators listening to are these yes men. Vladimir Putin may not have understood just how badly prepared the military was because Everyone who reported him did not want to risk getting him upset and then being killed. Uh, next slide. Now, another thing in democracy is, you know, if we lose an election, we can still run again. Uh, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, and for dictators, however, they're fundamentally interested in survival. They may hold ultimate power, but that hold is very, very fragile. Next slide. 
And so it often ends in exile in this case. Uh, that's the, the Shah of Iran uh, in exile in Panama. Next slide. Um, you can be imprisoned like Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, and then next slide. Or you can be sentenced to death like Saddam Hussein. And then the next slide, Muammar Gaddafi. Let's go from this slide. <laughs> so uh, next slide, please. And so what often happens with dictators is they have volatile foreign policies. They have bad decision making. Um, so an example of this, uh, next slide. Right, uh, Putin has very much decided to replace the military leadership a couple times just because they haven't accomplished what he wanted. <clears throat> it's about loyalty to the boss, not about operational effectiveness. In fact, the latest, I think this happened in January or February when uh, Putin decided to change again the new uh, gen the, 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 the leader of the, the command there. The previous leader had actually been doing pretty, relatively well. I mean, he was still getting his butt kicked, but <clears throat> he was doing a lot to stop the losses and reconsolidate Russian forces. Uh, he replaced them with a lackey, and you can see already that some of this is that the 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 the, the new general's decisions are just not as effective, are in, um, even as they have more and more personnel to throw at things. Next slide. Oh yeah, and then you get the mobilization. Let's just go to, next slide, please. And so so far, we've seen nothing but to some extent Russian defeat, uh, where. <clears throat> The Ukrainians have been able to push back against the Russians and uh, retake a whole bunch of the land that they, the Russians used to control. All right, next slide. So that's what the Russians did wrong. What did the Russians do right? And I'd say it comes down to three things. First off, they stabilized their society um, in response to the economic sanctions. Second, they've been fairly effective in the information war. And third, they found some international partners, most importantly, China. So uh, next slide. If you remember uh, at the start of the war, there were actually widespread protests uh, in Russia, and especially in Moscow, against what Moscow was doing. Uh, next slide. Um, here's just a quick chart um, that showed, like, you know, there uh, some from late February to early March, there were actually a significant number of protests, anti-war protests around Russia. Next slide, please. The problem was that despite this, at the very, very right-hand side here, you see that, you know, there may have been a lot of protests, but Approval ratings of Putin jumped up dramatically in the that kind of spike at the very end. That's the that's the war in Ukraine. Um, so Putin has done a fairly effective job of of kind of reigning in social or, or reigning in protests and stabilizing his society. Next, please. Next slide. There's also so, been so Ray. His ratings went up. Can we go one slide back? So his ratings at the end there yep. that went up during the war, right? Yep, that's right. Okay. Uh, we often call the halo effect or the rally around the flag effect. Um, mm. once, as soon as you start a war, it kind of jumps up <clears throat> your uh, your approval ratings. Mm. Uh, you can think about George H.W. Uh, uh, Bush in the first Iraq war. And the same thing happened. Same thing happened, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. War uh, presidents, just, right? Exactly. Uh, next slide, please. Russia has also been pretty effective at the disinformation campaign. Uh, actually, I actually was going to replace this slide with another picture, uh, but you know he's been able to galvanize. Uh, Russia has been able, to, or Putin has been able to galvanize a certain right-wing authoritarian streak within a number of different countries and get them to kind of parrot a lot of the Russian propaganda talking points. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, uh, Russia has been able to uh, acquire a number of international partners. Uh, China, first and foremost, they're still buying uh, Russian oil and gas. Europe as well, although that's, that, that amount is decreasing, has steadily decreased over time. Next slide. I think last week's meeting between Wang Yi and uh, Putin kind of sealed this, that uh, China is very much taking uh, Russia's side on this conflict. They're not doing everything. You know, There's still a question about whether or not uh, China would... Um, uh, uh, provide lethal, lethal assistance to Russia, but and they're certainly not going to be deploying troops to Ukraine. But you know, this partnership is deeper than it, it looks at first. So next slide. So as a result, Russia gets, at least in my mind, a C. You know, it's done pretty well given the hand it's been dealt. Um, <clears throat> and despite the fact it was facing off against much of, like a, a surprisingly strong foe, uh, but at the end of the day, it did make a whole bunch of mistakes having to do with the fact that Putin is a personalistic dictator. And therefore, there are a variety of institutional, political institutional issues uh, confronting him. Next slide, please. So that's Ukraine. That's Russia. What has the U.S. done right and wrong? Next slide. Um, you know, it's done a really good job at direct support for Ukraine, uh, galvanizing and coalescing European and Asian support for Ukraine, and also in 
kind of juggling both Asia and Europe. There's a question here about whether or not, you know, if the U.S. is tied down more in Europe, will it kind of ignore Asia? That doesn't seem to have been the, the case. It seems like um, the U.S. can walk and chew gum at the same time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we can talk about what the U.S. has done right, but what has the U.S. gotten wrong? Um, first off, the U.S. hasn't really been that effective in, in international leadership. It hasn't gotten the, the developing world support for Ukraine has been softening over time. And that's in part because the U.S. hasn't been engaging those uh, developing countries to keep that support going. And secondly, there is deterrence failure against Russia. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> this article came out, I believe, one or two weeks ago. Um, oh. See the thing I have here. Okay, um, and it's really I, I had circled it in red earlier, but maybe it didn't get on this uh, on the slide here. But um, the author here is the same author that I mentioned earlier. The head, uh, the guy who was a, a colonel in the U.S. Army Rangers, uh, a, a doctor uh, at, from Princeton, uh, head of the Modern War Institute. He makes a very cogent argument that the U.S. actually failed to deter in Ukraine. That while we've done a pretty good job since the war started, we did a terrible job before the war started in signaling to Russia and signaling to other countries that no, we are serious about actually helping Ukraine defend itself. We tended to restrict ourselves to giving too few weapons with too, too many conditions. We let the Russians take Crimea and, and Georgia. And then of course, next slide. The worst possible thing was uh, uh, Trump's call with President Zelensky saying, hey, I need you to do me a favor. It was <laughs> the most transactional way to conduct foreign policy that you know had Putin and certainly Zelensky been, you know, we're paying attention. Well, it means that we will not be actually defending you uh, and we kind of have no interest in doing so. So next slide. So overall, the United States gets a beat. You know, we did pretty well after the war started, but we were probably failing. Uh, uh, we were, sorry, we did, after, we did well after the war started, but before the war, we were probably getting a failing grade. We made up with extra points afterwards uh, for extra credit. Next slide. So what are the implications of all this for Taiwan security? Uh, next slide, please. First off, the main takeaways here are that, you know, from Ukraine, we learned that Taiwan urgently needs to prepare for its own defense. From Russia, we know that Taiwan can't necessarily count on China being that incompetent as Russia, um, and that shaping the international narrative is going to be critical. And then third, from our US, the US side and, part, and, and their partners, that it's important to declare strategic clarity and help prepare now. Next slide, please. So from the Ukraine, Ukrainians, we have a number of lessons uh, on, on the military side that asymmetric defense can actually work. Um, you know, the uh, Li Ximing's uh, uh, overall defense concept, I think, is will actually be able to work and defend against, allow Taiwan to defend against a much stronger China. That leadership, training, organization, and preparation are fundamental to this. You have to get your, not just your military, but your, your overall society ready for a fight. Um, and lastly, to some extent, there needs to be a way to get the Min Jindang and the Guo Fangbu to actually listen to each other and get on the same page. Um, to get behind, for the Guo Fangbu in particular, to get behind the Min Jindang in saying, okay, this is the strategy we're gonna take. This is the overall, we're, we're gonna implement the ODC. You got push forward with this and get everyone in line. Because right now, there's a lot of infighting between these two different organizations, and it's leading to a lack of leadership and a lack of clarity. Next slide, please. On the civilian side, the Ukrainian lessons are that this is a whole of nation effort. And there has to be something of a cultural shift. Uh, you know, we can't just say that, you know, uh, good people don't become conscripts or soldiers in the, in the same way that, you know, you don't use good iron for, uh, uh, a railway. Um, and we need to actually, on the civilian side, establish an effective territorial defense system, something that has actual organization and teeth behind it. Next slide. So, so far, a lot of this uh, territorial defense, whole of nation effort, is really being led by the civilian side. Uh, this is Enoch Wu. He used to run for, uh, what did he run for a le legislative run, I think? Um, and in, in, came really, really close to, uh, to unseating the, the KMT uh, uh, politician there. But, um, you know, he runs civil defense training. And last time I saw him, he was saying that, you know, every single day, every single training they run, they are like, they are full of volunteers and people wanting to, to sign up. Um, that needs to be relayed, not just within the civilian side, but it's something that the military and the, the political leadership actually needs to get behind as well. Next slide. So from the Russians, we know that China is not going to be as easy as Russia to defeat. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> um, and this is for a variety of reasons, you know, geography, China is better prepared, sanctions won't be effective as effective against China. And then we have a question about Taiwanese partners. So next slide. So in terms of geography, it's really easy to supply Ukraine. We've got a whole bunch of land borders, right? It does mean it's easier for Russia to invade Ukraine because they're right there on the land border. But it's also much easier for NATO to supply Ukraine because we have a whole bunch of land borders on the other side. Next slide. Taiwan's going to be much more difficult. Um, these circles here are what we call the WES, uh, the Weapon Engagement Zone. These are the ranges at which Chinese missiles can hit or attack uh, potentially uh, incoming forces. And so it, the, the Taiwan Strait does make it harder for Taiwan, uh, China to invade Taiwan, but it also makes it harder for partners and allies to support Taiwan as well. Next slide. China is much better prepared uh, than, than uh, Russia was against Ukraine. Um, most importantly, China has thousands of missiles, uh, all pointing, many of them pointed at Taiwan, and uh, Taiwan itself does not have many that can kind of retaliate back. Um, this is a really, really tricky military problem that Taiwan can do some more to, uh, in its own defense, but will also need uh, American and allied support as well, or partner support as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of sanctions, you know, the sanctions were relatively effective against Russia, uh, but that's not going to be the case with China necessarily. China is the world's largest manufacturer. It is a top or near the top trade partner for many countries. And as a result, it's going to be much harder to coerce. Uh, it's a much larger economy, and it's already trying to decouple itself from the United States and other and, and kind of other countries. Um, you know, we can cut off Russia with relatively little impact on the rest of the world, except for maybe energy. We can't necessarily do that with China. If you're going to do that with China, it's going to be painful. And part of the issue is that you have to prepare the public for that. Next slide. Oh, and lastly, I think one major issue is that China is facing a bit of a closing window of opportunity, at least according to Hal Brands and Michael Beckley. Hal Brands is a professor at SICE, uh, George, uh, John Hopkins, sorry, and Michael Beckley is a professor at uh, uh, Tufts, sorry. Um, so even as there are economic challenges that uh, China is facing, even as its debt load is increasing. Um, its military modernization is still on the rise, even as its economy and the demography might be going down. That produces a closing window of opportunity. Eventually, the military power is going to kind of go down as well. And so right now is the moment when China has the most, the greatest power advantage it will have, according to these two authors. And so we might see within the next 10 to 15 years, China being more and more aggressive and really trying to get Taiwan to capitulate via force. Next slide. And so in response to that, what should the US do? What lessons should the US learn from the Ukraine war? Well, first off, according to you know, the, the issue about deterrence failure the, the, by that particular author, Liam Collins, the US really does need to commit before the war. It's not enough to deter after the conflict has started, because most likely the lesson that China has learned from this war is that you get one shot and you better do it really quickly and really well. Um, they're, they're not going to give Taiwan a Crimea moment to allow Taiwan to figure out, oh, we need to get serious about this. If they want to go for it, they'll take the whole thing all at once. Um, and in order to respond to that, the U.S. needs to provide the commitment to Taiwan uh, in order to defer, deter conflict and improve Taiwanese defense. Uh, next slide. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've written a little bit about this in the last couple of years. Um, <clears throat> first on the uh, the war on the rocks piece in the top one here, and then secondly in farm uh, farm policy. So uh, next slide, please. So the last question here is like, what can I do? Or what can you as FALCA members do? And I, the answer is actually quite a lot. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so a lot of this comes down to advocacy and information. Um, <clears throat> you know. Taiwan doesn't have to face China alone. In fact, it probably can't, right? And so part of that is pushing for governments, both within the United States, within Taiwan, other partners to get together and take Taiwanese defense seriously and come up with a coordination and plan for how that defense can be actually be executed. Uh, secondly, it's about information. You know, one of the major things that happened with the Ukraine war was just how popular it was. Um, you know, and part of the reason why was because Ukrainian Americans or Ukrainian Frenchmen or Ukrainian Canadians were getting out there and saying, hey, they were acting as translators for what was going on in Ukraine uh, to, the, to their new homes, to saying to them, look, you may think this has nothing to do with you, 
but these are the these are my people back home and they're fighting for their lives in the same way that you have fought or you know, your ancestors have fought for or your ancestors have fought for their lives and also your country fought for its life they acted as that critical translation to take something from really far away and make it understandable and, and legible at home. And so you all at FAPA can actually do the exact same thing, whether that be on social media, through writing things through regular media, or engaging with civic groups. And especially civic groups are, are actually not Taiwanese. Um, in particular, it's important to try to create connections between Taiwanese groups and the non-Taiwanese groups in order to get those groups on your side. And so- uh, Such I as? Sir? Well, Such so for example- um, Tibetans, Uyghurs, that sort of thing? No, I think even broader, because the, the critical Amnesty. issue is... I'm sorry? Amnesty International. That also, other organizations, like, you know, there are a variety of civic groups. Um, so just, say, for example, here in Minnesota, uh, there's a lot of civic groups here who focus on um, foreign policy. It's just people who want to know more about foreign policy. Or... Um, <laughs> You know, there are any number of community groups here, like for the Hmong or for the Somalis, who are, you know, they have their own organizations and their own interests, but are also deeply curious about other countries and other sort of events happening in the world. Having those sorts of connections can actually be really helpful, um, at least in galvanizing the sort of public support for Taiwan over, uh, over the long term. Uh, so with that, next slide. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, let's give uh, Ray a round of warm applause. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Wow, excuse me. So, I have some questions, but is there anybody who already wants to say something? Is Ray. Um, yeah, so the, the strategic ambiguity, of course, is a very interesting uh, topic. What, after Biden having said four times, yes, we will be there, we will come to Taiwan's, we will send the cavalry, we will come to Taiwan's defense. Uh, what what more do we need for strategic ambiguity? And And which leads me to my question, really, do we have strategic ambiguity today, stopping short no, of the State Department or the Defense Department putting no. a stamp Thank on you. that product that we have, the situation that we have saying strategic ambiguity? Do, is it there? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, the State Department, every time Biden says that, does immediately roll it back. Um, I mean, I think in Biden's mind, there probably is not strategic ambiguity. He is ultimately the one that matters. But the problem is that, you know, Biden has, you know, maybe at best one more term, right? Uh, and so if you want this, if you want strategic clarity to last, it has to be institutionalized. It can't just be dependent on one person. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of do we have it already, um, you know, with Biden personally, yes, but he won't always be in charge. And so that's uh, that should be of deeper concern to Taiwan of how and Taiwanese Americans of how do you sustain and how do you extend this, uh, this, this strategic clarity? Also, you know, I, I would just like to note that, um, you know, a lot of uh, people in the kind of foreign policy, especially within the think tank world, uh, still really prefer ambiguity. Uh, <clears throat> And, you know, they think Biden is just messing up. Um, I will note that, like, the, the Taiwan Relations Act was in part written to look like a military alliance. Um, and uh, a lot of people tend to uh, kind of, uh, and, you know, and I think the, one, the major thing is that Biden was, is old enough, he actually signed the TRA. Right. Right. So he might actually think that this is a defense treaty. Um, but the next person that comes along who isn't quite as old, who didn't sign the TRA, you're just not sure what that person is thinking. So if you really want strategic clarity, you have to institutionalize it. Yeah, so we have strategic clarity at least until the end of uh, Biden's term, maybe, maybe four more years. But uh, you say we need to really institutionalize it yep. for future generations, for future right. presidents. Oh, uh, oh young. Yeah, oh. I see you raise your hand, right? But I mean, yeah, if, yeah, if yeah. anybody I in the room, 
Hey, hang on. Anybody okay. in the room? Uh, I saw somebody raise his hand before me. Yeah, Garrett, also, just speak up uh, because I cannot see Can really on my on? screen all the everybody. So if you have a question, just speak up. So let's go with Oyan first. Okay, then Garrett. All right. All right. Uh, Ray, yeah, this is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Question You want to comment about this uh, identity issue between, you know, between the Ukraine and the Taiwan? I know the eastern part of the Ukraine, almost majority of people are poor. You would say poor Russian, right? Uh, Russian. And the same thing in Taiwan also have maybe 20, 30 percent. They are not pro China, but they, at least they are friendly to China. And uh, what I know right now, I heard that the East uh, Ukraine people, they are, because they are the herb the most uh, than the, the other part of Uk Ukraine's people. So they are, their identity issue, identity was changing to the more, more, more. More Ukraine. You want to comment on this uh, between these two, you know, uh, Taiwan and Ukraine? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, Taiwan starts in a better position than Ukraine does on this identity issue. <clears throat> that I mean, you know, when you were thinking about the eastern provinces in in Ukraine, you're really dealing with not just neutral towards Russia, but pro-Russia. Um, but you know, uh, there's a political scientist named Charles Tilley, and he said, "War makes the state, and the state makes war." And, you know, we often know what the second part means, right? Countries go to war and they do things, right? But what we often forget is the first part of the phrase, war makes the state. In other words, the process of fighting, the process of coming together to fight against an external enemy often brings together people uh, in a way that almost nothing else does. And so, you know, there are any variety of, I think on social media, you often see um, Ukrainian soldiers Game together and singing like the Ukrainian national anthem, that was un almost unthinkable prior uh, prior to, to 2022, and certainly was unthinkable prior to 2014. And so, at least in this regard, you know, if uh, I, nobody wants a war between China and Taiwan, but if a war were to come out, <clears throat> um, uh, I would expect a strong surge in Taiwanese nationalism, and the kind of 20 to 30 percent will kind of be forced to make their choice, and they'll probably choose Taiwan. And the reason why I think this is important is that, you know, we have to entertain the possibility that Taiwan will lose, that it will be conquered by China. But what's important to understand is that many countries have been conquered by others in the past. Think about Poland. But the thing about nationalism, the thing about sort of self-identity is that those countries come back. Poland disappeared from the face of the earth for what, like 100, 200 years? And after World War II, it came roaring back as a nationality. Taiwan. As much as we think about a war between China and Taiwan being the end point, um, I don't think that is necessarily the case. Uh, you have only looked to look at Hong Kong and Cantonese people and understand that, yeah, because of what China is doing, Cantonese identity is actually much stronger now than it was before. And it's something similar would definitely happen with Taiwan if there were a war. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Oya. Uh, we have a couple more questions. So uh, first we have Garrett, and then we have Minze, and then we have Jung Min Ju. And I also want to remind Janelle that we need to take a screenshot at some point with everybody <laughs> on it for future generations as well. So Garrett, go ahead. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, good job, Ray, in the presentation. I do want to come back on the point of strategic uh, ambiguity, as you could expect. Um, I fully agree with you that we need to institutionalize strategic clarity much more in the thinking of the policy community here in DC. Um, but I, I, I want to just recount that I did some research in the origin of strategic ambiguity and I found the writing of Robert Suttinger, who was uh, at the National Security Council in 2000, uh, sorry, 1995, when Joseph Nye was launching this idea of strategic ambiguity over <laughs> at DOD. And Suttinger says in his book, we at the State Department and at the NSC didn't want to have anything to do with strategic ambiguity. Uh, that was just an idea uh, thrown around by Joseph Nye. But the problem is it got picked up in the press and it got picked up by the uh, think tank community. So it got a life of its own that anytime the president says we will defend Taiwan, they jump up and down and say, no, 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 we have strategic ambiguity. But 
strategic ambiguity was never written into any policy document whatsoever. So it's still a figment of imagination that goes around in the press and the and the and the community. But of course, there are some people in uh, in the policy world who uh, kind of think it might be a good idea. So actually the person who usually responds after a Biden statement is not the State Department. I've talked to people at the State Department and they say, no, we are actually very supportive of the president. It is Mr. Jake Sullivan over at the National Security Council who uh, kind of starts uh, jump, jumping up and down and he has his ideas about it and he is leaning a little bit more towards the uh, ambiguity uh, uh, scenario because that gives him the freedom to maneuver and move around. So uh, anyway, I thought that was an important piece of uh, background information for the whole discussion, but fully agree with you on moving forward uh, on strategic uh, clarity. And one more point on this is that actually in the Taiwan Relations Act, the US usually only emphasizes that we will help Taiwan defend itself. But there is a next clause in the Taiwan Relations Act, which says we, United States, will maintain the capacity to deter any use of force against Taiwan. Hey, that is pretty darn strong. That's maybe yeah. not quite not quite a uh, NATO agreement Article 5, but it gets pretty close to it. So I think people are starting to emphasize that uh, much more now. You hear it from the State Department. Uh, Antony Blinken has used that clause several times. DOD has used it several times. So I think we are moving in the right direction in terms of institutionalization. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think one of the major issues or one of the issues, not frustrations that I've had <laughs> is that the, the China hands within D.C. are often the ones tapped for the Taiwan policy. And so they tend to look at Taiwan as just a, either a distraction or an appendage to China. Um, <clears throat> and so I think as a result, their interpretation of things like the Taiwan Relations Act uh, tend to minimize it as much as possible because they feel like they have a, a, a larger or, or, or bigger a, a bigger issue to deal with. Um, and so, you know, a lot of them, you know, I've got some people in my head, but, you know, we'll treat uh, the Taiwan Relations Act as nothing more than an arms agreement. Um, but when you point out to them, like, actually, no, it's written like an alliance. Uh, and that's for a reason. It's written to, to offer the United States, a, a, to, to offer Taiwan some kind of American commitment. Maybe not Article 5, but it's, it's somewhat something there. Um, they get really upset about that. And I think, you know, the, the thing that really upsets or kind of frustrates me about all this is, you know, there's been a, a, a variety of other pieces that have come out recently saying we have to maintain strategic ambiguity. And my retort to them is always, look, the status quo has fundamentally changed. Chinese power is, you can see it, it's like it's, it's manifest. <clears throat> and you're telling me that if we keep doing the same thing, even though the same thing has been leading to a status quo that shifts against us, somehow the result will be better? I have a definition of insanity out there and that this kind of fits right there. And so we need to be doing something different. Um, and I, you know, that's the genesis of the article. And I, I do agree with you, Uncle Garrett, uh, that I think the DC community is starting to wake up to that and shifting in that direction. But there are still a lot of influential voices going in the opposite way, unfortunately. I like yep. that you say Uncle Garrett. Uh, well. <laughs> I think we all just got a glimpse of how a Thanksgiving dinner at the Quo family looks like. My mom would yell at me otherwise. That one. <laughs> I will call Garrett from now on Uncle Garrett when I see him. <laughs> so, um, uh, Raymond, uh, it's my yeah, time, Yeah, right? you're next. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for your presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, one thing I, I noticed you in on one of your slides, you mentioned about uh, Min Jintang, DPP and uh, National Defense Department, right? So it's not just that. I think um, if you look at um, the situation there, you know uh, Taiwan is an open society. So they are potentially, I think they uh, certainly have many, many uh, agents from China, right? And then uh, <coughs> that kind of influence, uh, some got reported, that we know some uh, military officer, officer, right? They they can be uh, 
working on their, their side, on Chinese side. So <laughs> that is a, a, a situation I think Taiwan needs to deal with. And I want to ask your question, uh, I mean, your recommendation on how Taiwan can better uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, protect itself uh, from this kind of threat. Because uh, uh, with that question in mind, it's very hard for American, right, to give yeah. the best uh, uh, things uh, uh, military-wise or arms sale to 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 give to Taiwan. And the next day, all the information will will be in, in Chinese hand. So right. that is a concern. Some uh, of the uh, State Department or people here I met, they, they even mentioned to us, say yeah. you Chinese government need to do a better job in protect that. So what do you think? Uh, what, what, what do you suggest? So no, that's a great question. Um, and, a, and, and a really challenging issue. And so <clears throat> I think where there's a, a, a whole three, four points here. First off, with Ukraine actually had a fairly similar sort of experience. The US was not giving Ukraine its <clears throat> best weapons. You know, it's giving weapons that were, you know, 20 years old. And it turns out those weapons are still pretty good at shooting down Russian jets or taking out <laughs> Russian tanks. So, you know, we Taiwan may not need the most advanced weapons, which should help to deal with some of these security issues. <laughs> now Another thing that Ukraine went through that is a lesson for Taiwan is that, you know, there's a concern that Ukraine was penetrated by defectors or spies or traitors, right? Um, and it turns out those guys mostly ran, right? There was, uh, I believe, Russia, had, it came out that Russia had spent like a billion dollars uh, to bribe uh, various um, Ukrainian uh, governors of the provinces, of some of the provinces. And the idea was that when uh, Russia would launch the war, these guys would suddenly turn around and declare we favor Russia and we're going to join the Russian uh, Russian country, uh, state. Um, turns out, though, that those guys all took the money and ran, in part because they realized as soon as the war happened how upset people were and that if they were, do, if they were to do that, right, if they were to declare in favor of Russia, they would be dragged out into the street and shot. Um, <clears throat> so there are, while, well, you know, the concern about um, what they call fifth columns is a concern. There are other sort of factors and forces that may mitigate against it. Um, and in terms of what Taiwan can do specifically to help itself, um, you know, to some extent, it needs better domestic organization. Um, it doesn't have a Department of Homeland Security like the United States does. Some uh, entity that can coordinate, not just uh, you know, the intelligence or counterintelligence issues, but also things like infrastructure, natural hazards, <laughs> uh, policing. Um, an entity like that would actually be kind of helpful in gathering information and, co and, and, and collating information, try to figure out who might be working against the Taiwanese government and in kind of either isolating them or arresting them or, or neutralizing them in one way or another, usually throwing them in jail. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Um... We have uh, Jung Ming Ju and then Thomas. Okay. <coughs> Me? No, Jung Ming Ju, right? I, I think uh, um, that was there yeah. at the beginning, since the beginning. I think probably not. not, not really. Oh, okay. False alarm. False alarm. Okay, then it's Thomas' turn. Okay. Uh, my question uh, thank you, Ray, for your presentation. Your topic is talking about ambiguity and clarity. My question is uh, really, uh, last year when Russia go, uh, invade, invade Ukraine, if if United States at the time, for instance, do not, dec do not say that we're going to withdraw mm -hmm. the embassy from Kiev, and also, like, uh, like uh, Afghanistan, at the time was pretty uh, messy with, with Raw. Yeah. So Putin think the United States would be kind of weak if he invade the, uh, Ukraine, you will not come to the defense of uh, mm -hmm. Ukraine. That's what I, I say. Could that because of that? And you, you, you mean the defense of Taiwan, they, I think. Not, not clear, so, so he invade the, uh, if that's United States, same thing. If say very clearly about going to defend Taiwan right now, I think uh, 
Biden say four times in the interview, openly says that he will come to Taiwan, Taiwan's defense. Right. So the chances of that one is clearly clarified and one is ambiguity become the case is a case of case in point is being invaded would this deter china in fact that uh, we um well okay just to let you come in yeah. i'll put my question here so no that's it's a good question here i mean i think the afghanistan withdrawal was messy and i i struggle to think of any occupation that ends that has ended in a positive way Right. Um, we all remember the, the fall of Saigon, the iconic picture of people scrambling in on the last helicopter. Um, it's because uh, it, it's a bit of a, a, a prisoner's dilemma issue that as soon as one thing falls, everything else collapses as well. Um, but, you know, I think authoritarian regimes often misunderstand democratic ones. Um, democracy, I mean, I think democracies misunderstand themselves. Um, democracies fight really, really hard. Um, if you upset a democracy, they will come after you and they won't stop until you're defeated. Uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, or they decide that they want to give up. Um, and so I think Russia, uh, Putin in particular, took the wrong lesson from Afghanistan. If he thought that, okay, well, the U.S. is withdrawing, it doesn't care about anything, he misunderstood that, no, letting Afghanistan go gives the U.S. a whole bunch of more additional resources to fight whatever else it wants to do. Um, and it has less to do with what the the you know uh, what the the withdrawal itself signals, but more what the U.S. will do with the resources from that withdrawal. That's what he should be focusing on. In terms of strategic clarity in China, I think the the big issue here is one of timing. You know, like I don't think you want to declare strategic clarity immediately and then hope everything else works out, because that will be a recipe for disaster. If the U.S. declares clarity before Taiwan and the U.S. are prepared. China will invade and it's going to be a big, ugly mess for everybody. What you want instead is to work privately with the Taiwanese to build up their capacity to defend itself uh, while privately telling them that you will uh, seek clarity with them eventually, um, <clears throat> that the strategy and the policy will eventually change to match that. Because you have to give the Taiwanese incentive for why they should undertake all these defensive procedures and upset the Chinese and that kind of thing. Um, I tend to think the strategic clarity should be coming, it should be at the end of this process, not the beginning of this process, but it needs to be communicated privately to the Taiwanese government that this is what the United States eventually wants to do and give them in that incentive to do all the defense preparation. Thanks, Ray. And then thank next you. one is Jung Tsai. Yes, uh, thank you for your talk. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes, we can My name you. is Dr. Jung Tsai. I don't have a statement. I just have a two simple question to you. Number one question, have, have you ever been in Ukraine? If not, uh, would, do you plan to go anytime in the near future? If yes, could you tell us uh, your experience? That's question number one. Question, okay. number, question number two, uh, we, the Taiwanese the North American Physician Association, plan to go to Ukraine, do the medical mission. Uh, most of our younger generation doctor, and we have a connection, we plan to go on August. Do you have any specific suggestion to us? Oh, wow. Uh, so definitely no on the second question. Um, I, uh, so let me start with the first question. No, I've never been to Ukraine. Um, I. And not sure I'm allowed to go, given my employer. Uh, that would be something like we 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 have restrictions in terms of commentary. Just speaking about Ukraine, I'm not sure how that would how it would work in terms of actually physically going there. Um, uh, in terms of advice, no, I I don't unfortunately. Um, but I could put you in touch with people who would be much better placed, since they're more Ukraine specialists or Russia specialists than I am. I'm I'm very much not. Yeah, let's bring uh, Ray and Dr. Tsai together, uh, you know, email-wise, and see if they can uh, be of help. Thank you, Ray. Okay. And nice to see you, Dr. Tsai. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining today. Thank you. Uh, Julia Chu, next one.
Julia, are you there? Are these the two questions in the chat? Uh, I think Julia's first, but if Julia's not here, we can come back to her and then we let Josephine go first. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm the member of Hawaii chapter and also oh, a woman organization represent for INLW and ADLW. So I'm actually in New York, very cold here <laughs> for the UN's <laughs> meeting and CSW meeting. But anyway, I appreciate Dr. Cole's uh, presentation. My question is in your presentation, uh, even though there are two gentlemen mentioned that, but you did mention too much in your presentation is Taiwan, not only for the defense tour to China, but mm -hmm. inside the nation identity. We know now DPP deal with the uh, biggest oppos opposition party, which came to still very much embrace one China policy. So that part, I think the Taiwanese government, whoever become the next ruling party, need to deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm thinking is uh, because of Ukraine-Russian battles, so people mm -hmm. starting pay more attention to cross-strait intention. Right. Because China's missile set up aim to Taiwan, it's more than two decades, as far as we know. So I'm I'm not a military special specialty research uh, person. So I, I was wondering is there any way that Taiwan can build up a stronger missile seal system? I don't know whether is this your feel or not. Can you answer a question like this to me? Sure. Um, so in terms of the Taiwanese identities, uh, you know, Air <coughs> Two set up uh, came to DC what, last year in order to. Uh, 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 to to kind of cut the Last ribbon one, on the yeah. New, yeah the on the new KMT office in DC, you know he took pains to say that the KMT was not the pro China party it was a pro US party and you know I was like oh, okay sure dude whatever you think, whatever you say but I think that's reflective of the fact that in Taiwan uh, a like a a unification position or a pro China position is just a politically dead. Right, um, it, it is. It, uh, it, you know, at the local on the local level elections, sure, you know, but the KMT has significant um, grassroots operations, money, funding, but you know, those elections don't usually turn on questions of identity and national security, whereas the presidential and legislative ones tend to do that. Um, and so, and you notice at that, that point, you know, the KMT is like, eh, we're, we're going to not say as much about uh, about China as a result. Um, so I, I think that you know there are sort of political headwinds for any local party in Taiwan trying to you know promote greater closer ties with with China. Uh, it also often kind of surprises me that you know in the wake of the sunflower movement, the DPP did a relatively good job in sort of co-opting some of the the the, the movements that came up from um, from the, the from the younger people. The uh, but even so, there were a variety of new political parties that were established. The KMT did not really do a very good job with that. Um, and it always surprises me that there isn't a new party that comes up that adopts most of the KMT's positions, but dumps the pro-China stuff. Um, they would do, I think, quite well, but something the KMT has, whether it's organization, money, something else, prevents that from happening. I'd love to know more about that, about why that happens and, and you know, the, the kind of the risk of that sort of thing, or that sort of shift in, in Taiwanese politics. Uh, in terms of missile defense, so, <clears throat> you know, yeah, sure, there could be more defenses, that, uh, missile defenses that, that Taiwan can develop uh, or purchase maybe from other countries. The problem is that China has so many missiles. Um, you know, for, <clears throat> you know, the Israeli Iron Dome system, which is meant to take out rockets, right? It's not meant to take out missiles, just rockets usually. It can get overwhelmed by uh, like, I think a dozen or so rockets at a time. Um, missile defense just as a technology is, it's it's pretty good, but it's not meant to deal with uh, saturation bombing. It's not meant to deal with like a, like a thousand missiles coming all at once. Uh, there's just no way. Um, instead, what Taiwan could do is harden their, uh, harden their structures so that you know, if it, if three or four missiles hit it, it doesn't really matter. There, you know, that that building would be protected. Um, 
or and also but you know that only works so far with military <laughs> installations that doesn't necessarily help with civilian um for the, the civilian side you need to have organization that everyone knows their role they know who's the back who's the leader who's the backup leader and what to do uh and and where to go to get the stuff done um that is a pretty big undertaking um and yeah it's it's a difficult thing but you know the Israelis are able to do it, I guess. So, well, to some extent, and it's it's possible that to be done. Thank That's you right. for your answer. And thanks, Josephine, and thanks for joining. Um, uh, let's Shane Lai uh, ask the question. Uh, please, please unmute yourself. Shane, are you there? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Shen Nai. I belong to the Northern California chapter. Um, I know uh, thanks to uh, 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 Raymond for the for the speech, but uh, I have uh, just uh, one one question, okay, and then also some comments. Um, basically, I know that in here we all talk about how we can, uh, you know, make a, a Taiwan stronger and then also how to defend ourselves, but I'm thinking the the main reason why um, uh, China want to take over Taiwan is because, uh, you know, they think we belong to them, and we know that even though that's not true. But when soon we worked uh, to working uh, toward making Taiwan really, really uh, an, an an independent country, then in that case, then they would it would not be they, it would be the appropriateness for them to to do all this attacking and all that. So. I know that if in the past, our, you know, our, our president and, and everybody is all saying that oh, Taiwan is already and uh, it's already been an um, independent uh, entity. But <laughs> that's also part of the ambiguity. Why couldn't we really, you know, always maybe the help of of uh, uh, USA as a, uh, that's probably the main main thing I think to help us and then also internally. I know that most of our Taiwanese really want to be an independent country, but can we work toward that toward that and then so that to declare we as really a, 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 a independent country so that you know because part of this thing is we say that ukraine ukraine is it's a it's really a country but we we are so we we, we are just cheat, sort of telling ourselves that we, we are independent already so we don't have to declare again but that's um, then you have this ambiguity there why why wouldn't we you know working toward that direction we we make ourselves a really a, uh, a, 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 a Taiwan country, then then there will be no. It's an, if even if uh, China is still were thinking of, of attacking us and taking us over, there will be no uh, appropriateness in there already. Then the whole whole world would would, would criticize them. Would would also help us. So well, I mean, I think that's yeah. the issue right there, right? Like yeah. as much yeah. as they would criticize, <clears throat> they wouldn't necessarily help. You know. Uh, uh, developing country support for Ukraine is already softening. Um, mm -hmm. You see that countries in the Middle East, Latin America, parts of Africa, to say like, look, this is just not our fight. We just don't care. Uh, it's their prerogative to do so. Um, and I think the bigger issue for me is that the United States, um, Japan, South Korea, Europe, they don't necessarily want to see, they don't necessarily care if Taiwan is independent. They care that Taiwan is under its own control. And that's a really fine but important distinction that if Taiwan declares independence, the, the, a lot of these countries feel like, well, it's a Hokkaid, like you, you had it coming, right? What they want to see is that Taiwan serves as a bulwark against China, uh, which doesn't require it to be independent. It just requires, uh, like, uh, to declare independence, it just requires it to be independent. Um, so if you're Japan or you're South Korea, for example, you're really concerned if China gets control of Taiwan and it blocks off all the sea routes going up to, to Japan. But that, you know, declaring independence is not part of that, right? You don't care one way or the other whether or not uh, Taiwan has declared independence. And in fact, you, to some extent, would be concerned if Taiwan declares independence because it might inspire China to go attack and therefore um, uh, take over Taiwan. And then you're in kind of the worst of all worlds. So it's important here to understand what partners, our interests actually are, and why even if Taiwan were to declare independence, that wouldn't necessarily bring the support that we would yeah. actually hope. Okay, thank right. you for your, for your answer. <laughs> I'm, 
I don't know if I, I totally agree, but thank you for your answer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Shane. Thanks, Ray. Okay. The next is my friend, Tim, Tim Chong. <laughs> And Tim, uh, whose uh, first name stands for uh, Taiwan Independence Movement. Hey, huh, Tim. <laughs> hey, long time. Hey, Ray. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, uh, simple question. Um, what's the chance that Taiwan could become a part of the Quad? And where is the Quad stance towards having Taiwan be a member? And maybe you could explain the quad because I think that'd be useful for this conversation. Sure, yeah. It's the quadrilateral security dialogue. It was started in the wake of the 2005 tsunami in Asia. Um, it encompasses the United States, Japan, Australia, and uh, what am I missing? India. I say Japan, Australia, and India, sorry, India. <laughs> um, uh, initiated by Shinzo Abe, the uh, recently assassinated uh, former Japanese prime minister. Um, <clears throat> The it it actually kind of died for a while, and it got dusted off again um, uh, recently uh, due, uh, for all these countries to kind of come together and and face off uh, face against China's threat. The thing with the Quad is it's not it's not exactly a military organization. They've only done one uh, kind of joint exercise, combined exercise amongst their navies, and that's pretty much it. Uh, it's more of a political organization. And they have done some stuff in economics, like trying to create a strategic reserve of rare earth metals, uh, but they're primarily a coordination and discussion forum. And so the question is, uh, would Taiwan be invited to join? Answer is probably not. Um, until these, until the United States decides that we want to recognize Taiwan as maybe not as a full country, but at least more of a country in a way that strategic clarity would allow, other countries tend to stay away from Taiwan. Uh, if anybody's going to join, it'd be South Korea, uh, first and foremost. <clears throat> uh, so unfortunately, I, I don't think uh, uh, at this juncture, Taiwan's not going to be asked to join, even though it could probably benefit from a lot of that. But I think there is an interesting question here of, you know, Taiwan isn't allowed to participate in many multilateral institutions. But there are these a variety of new institutions that are emerging, AUKUS, um, <clears throat> the Quad certainly being one. There's a trilateral cooperation agreement between the United States, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, there's a bunch appearing in Europe as well. Um, the Taiwan, Taiwan could actually take advantage of some of these new, what we call, minilateral institutions, uh, or try to create their own as a way to get around some of the existing blockages in the, the, the existing international institutions. And which reminds me, Tim and Ray and everybody, that we're we're campaigning for um, the upcoming APEC meeting will take place in San Francisco in November, and it's up to the host, the United States, to invite whoever they want to invite. And of course, to the APEC, usually lower echelon Taiwanese uh, delegates were sent there, but. We, Mem some members of Congress we talked to believe that it's time for the United States to invite Tsai Ing-wen to that meeting oh, in San Francisco. Wow. Yeah, and the second one is that the Monterey talks, of course, between the United States and Taiwan, which happen, uh, I think, yearly. Uh, we we talked to some LDP Japanese legislators who believe that they should be invited too to the. Uh, uh, Monterey talks, and we 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 spread this uh, idea among some members of Congress, and so th there's also general excitement, and in, in, so these are two ways for Taiwan to uh, broaden their international exposure and attention. I want to give Julia one more time a chance to say something, but I'm not sure if that will work. Julia, are you there? And then it's otherwise. I, I can also answer based on the questions that she put in the chat as well. Okay. That works. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so Julia, I think had a couple questions here. Um, the first one that the Taiwanese begins to see that military strategic clarity can help to turn Ch to turn China, but some in, um, in the U.S. use political and amb strategic ambiguity to validate that Taiwan is just a pawn in a greater U.S.-China geopolitical struggle. How should this be interpreted? So. <clears throat> You know, Josh Rogan released a book, uh, I think last year, where he talked about the Trump administration. He talked about how uh, the call with Tsai Ing-wen uh, that Trump had. Um, and then um, later on, he recounts that uh, Trump actually had no intention of 
protecting Taiwan. Once he figured out what, what the stakes were actually involved, he said, <laughs> look, um, you know, I think he said something like, Taiwan is two fucking feet away from China. If they want to have it, we can't stop it. <clears throat> and there's this concern, and I think it's justified, about whether or not Taiwan is, is just the pawn. And there are plenty of people in the DC community who just think of Taiwan as a way to beat the Chinese over the head, as opposed to actually caring about Taiwanese uh, sovereignty and, and kind of self-rule by uh, on its own. And so I think it's, 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 a, it's a great question. How can you avoid that, right? <clears throat> well, I think one, um, Taiwan has to demonstrate its worth, and I think it's done that. Uh, but it's worth to the United States in the U.S.-led inter liberal international order. Secondly, in terms of American politics and the relationship between Taiwan and the United States, um, <clears throat> these things have to be done. And I, I, I'm a big believer in institutionalization, because if it's just down to individuals, then you do get the issue with someone like Trump, who just says, I just want to take advantage of Taiwan for my own purposes to deal with the Chinese. I'm not actually interested in Taiwan's own interests here. Um, and a way to get around some of that sort of mistrust or possibility for mistrust is to create institutions and closer ties, <clears throat> uh, and not just economic ones, but especially political ones um, that allow for exchange of information and communication across these two governments uh, to avoid being Taiwan being used as a pawn here. Um, also, I think that <clears throat> the more Taiwan can coalesce with other countries in the region. Um, and, and speak through them or with them, that also helps out as well to emphasize to the United States that you can't just treat the Taiwanese as something you can take advantage of. You have to actually deal with their issues and their interests on their own level. Um, Thanks, Ray. Is that about, because we have Frank there raising his hand a couple of times. Uh, so the, the, is there more, for, hang on a second, Frank. Li Shio Tan Chi Dei, Frank. Ray, is that... Uh, enough for julia i i didn't uh, there was one I'm more so... question but we can we can get to that some other time i guess okay let's go to frank then frank okay in denver uh, yes i have a colleague in the university of colorado they they he they is a pro, he's a politi political science retired retired faculty <laughs> and uh, he said that the main pro the main problem for taiwan is that uh, uh, well, well, somebody already, Julie or somebody already raises. The problem between China, Taiwan and China is the internal, pro, internal politics, okay? Taiwan is not completely different from Ukraine because Ukraine is a sovereign country. Taiwan is not as recognized as a sovereign country. So in case China invade Taiwan, that's an internal problem. Not so, not other country cannot interfere with the internal problem. So under what pretense, or what, what name, other country can inter, interfere with the Chinese invasion to Taiwan. There is no legal, Internationally, it is not internationally that the Taiwan is Taiwan, they have no excuse or no reason to interfere mm. with Chinese internal problem. I mean, yes and you no. Know, Japan, right? I would... For example, <laughs> I, well, Japan, Japan, mm. Japan's constitution says that. Unless the country is a sovereign country, you cannot interfere with other, Japan will not interfere with other countries' internal problem. Mm -hmm. So it is very questionable. Even Japan may not come to help Taiwan. Right. <laughs> I mean, how I to, think how to solve this dilemma. dilemma. Well, I think you solve it by the fact that what is defined as an internal affair is kind of slippery, right? It's more political than it is legal. Um, you know, do the Philippines, does Vietnam, Malaysia, do they consider the South China Sea to be an internal affair like China claims it is? Pretty sure they don't. Pretty sure they consider it to be an international affair. <laughs> China can say it's an internal affair all it wants. Other, other countries can say, you know, go screw yourself. It's not an internal affair. Um, also, 
if we really want to get semantic with things, right? Um, you know, what's what's the biggest, what has the most impact on another country's internal affairs? Trade. Uh, when you trade with another country, you actually fundamentally change their internal structures and your internal economic systems. Um, but I don't see the Chinese complaining about that at all. Uh, <clears throat> I think a bigger issue is this. We can focus on the the legal side of it, about whether or not <clears throat> Taiwan is considered to be a sovereign nation, and as a result, that will mean that countries can support or not. Um, I don't think that is as that it's an important issue. For example, Kenya came out very strongly in support of Ukraine in the UN General Assembly because it said we stand up for the principle of sovereign territorial integrity, and this is a violation of that, and so we were going to we're going to claim that. Um, <clears throat> maybe Taiwan would not get the support of Ukraine, oh, sorry, of, of Kenya in this sort of fight. But, because, you know, the Chinese propaganda is convinced some people. But that said, I don't know if that's the strongest reason for countries to want to support Taiwan. If you're Japan, for example, you are really, really concerned about Taiwan falling into China's hands. Because, you know, 70, I think even a greater percent of your, of your trade flows southwards right along Taiwan. And if you aren't able to have that security, um, if the United States Navy is kind of pushed out of that area, or if, uh, you know, I think Douglas MacArthur called Taiwan an unsinkable aircraft carrier and submarine tender. And he meant this, not that the United States should own it or the United States should have influence over it, but as a warning that what would happen if the Chinese communists got the island? That's, it would be something that allows them to project power into the Western Pacific. Uh, and if you're Japan, if you're South Korea, this is a real problem for you. Um, and so that is a strong reason for them want to want us to, to, to line up with us. For countries like in Central and Eastern Europe, it has to do with solidarity against uh, a small country being bullied by a big country, which they are very familiar with. For countries like Australia, uh, even the Philippines to some extent, it has a lot to do with their material interests too. So. You know, the sovereignty question is an important one. I think those ideas, those kind of norms and international uh, kind of ideas do matter, but um, they aren't the only thing. And there are a lot of strong reasons for other countries to want to line up and in favor of Taiwan. And on top of that, you know, the countries that are lining up in favor of Taiwan are pretty powerful. You know, like I don't really care if <laughs> Sri Lanka, for example, decides to, well, maybe I care about Sri Lanka, like Benin. Um, I don't really care if Benin says we don't care. Like, we don't care about the Taiwanese. We're we're fully in support of China. Um, I care if France, the UK, Japan, the United States, and most of those countries have lined up with Taiwan on this sort of fight. Also, there was a recent piece about the way countries interpret the One China policy, which was really interesting. Uh, this happened in the last three months. I need to find it. Um, that very few countries, other than like Russia, are like no, no, no. One China means that Taiwan's part of China and China owns it and nothing else will change that. For a lot of other countries, they think, sure, China says this and we just don't want to be hassled. That's a very different sort of position than we will support you, Beijing, in this goal. Thank you. If I may come in on this, uh, Ray, for just a second, I fully agree with Ray's response to Frank Shaw's uh, uh, excellent question. Um, but actually, U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken just the other day emphasized very strongly that this is not an internal affair between China and Taiwan. It is something that matters for the whole world and precisely as Ray just emphasized because Taiwan is very important economically to other countries if there is an attack against Taiwan then the whole world economy will go down the drain because of the chips so there are many more reasons than just the legal reasons but specifically on the point that you mentioned that well we do not recognize Taiwan as a sovereign country my response to that has always been you should make a distinction between diplomatic recognition and Taiwan being a country Taiwan is a country under international law if you look at the 1933 Montevideo Convention, it gives all the qualifications for a country. Taiwan qualifies under each of those points. So it is 
presently under the name Republic of China, Taiwan, a country. Other countries uh, stopped, uh, cut off their diplomatic recognition because the government in Taiwan at that time, in the 70s, still claimed to be government of China. That claim was de-recognized. But now, of course, as we all know, Taiwan is has become through the democratic transition, a democratic country. So it is fully a country, but diplomatic recognition is still lagging because policies are still rooted in the so-called one China policy from the 1970s. And that process is gradually changing and is changing pretty fast. You've seen how much the United States is moving in Taiwan's direction. In Europe also, a lot of countries are really moving much closer to Taiwan. So we are moving in the, in the right direction, I think. Thanks. Thank you, Garrett. Ray, is there anything you want to add to that, or are oh, we okay? Great. okay? Yeah. Thank uh, you, Garrett. Uh, you will be one of our uh, invited next open house speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, one thing, you know, it, we have reached our, our time, and I don't want to, uh, you know, prevent Ray from joining his kids on this slippery slopes <laughs> because he's skiing in uh, Minnesota. The literal slippery slopes but um ray one more thing very quickly a quick fire round as we say in these cooking okay. shows on hbo <laughs> how about taiwan president Tsai Wen coming to dc that that's kind of a hot topic at the moment what do you what do you say to that oh geez i didn't even I, wait is it really i didn't know, yeah, you know uh, it... there's some some talk about that yeah and members of congress have been talking about it for about maybe eight years already <laughs> But do, do, do you, is this a whole a whole new thing for you? Yeah. Huh. You haven't written an article about that. No, I have. It'd be great if it if it did if she if she really come. But like, I do wonder whether or not the juice is worth the squeeze. Um, you know what I would you know for me, if there's any if there's any one thing I want to see happen in the U.S. town relationship within the next year is the passage of the Town Policy Act. And specifically, making sure that the Policy Act <laughs> um, is focused as much as possible on the substantive defense and, and political preparations that Taiwan can get, um, <clears throat> as opposed to anything else. Uh, uh, and so, you know, uh, I would also love to see a free trade agreement between the United States and Taiwan. But mm -hmm. well, let's. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, so that you you kind of triggered one of the issues that is that my. Uh, co-workers get tired of because I've said it so many times but the uh, Taiwan Policy Act of course the big thing and I think you already hinted hinting at that a little bit is that the issue of symbolism versus substance yeah. and scholars always write and Bonnie Glazer uh, write, <laughs> we need substance if we all do something for Taiwan not symbolism and right. symbolism she means techro name change um from techro to taiwan representative office uh, one of our issues where we want to see the uh, director of the american institute in taiwan be confirmed by the senate but interestingly enough and and it has taken root that that uh, that that saying is that for taiwan symbolism is substance oftentimes yeah. and it started in shabbat's office the foreign affairs aid 23 year old kid said that to me one time i said it to mr shabbat who said it to bonnie glazer in an open virtual meeting with with a couple of hundred people then yeah. joseph Wu, the, the president uh, the, the foreign minister took it up in a conference at the hudson institute so i think we we should realize that you know it's, uh, some some congressman uh, remember uh, last month uh, oh young Mike Lawler from New York, he said, yeah, like moving the embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Yeah, the, maybe people will say that's just symbolism, but it it's more than symbolism, these kind of things. So let, let's let's not just poo-poo a yeah. couple of these issues and just say, oh, yeah, you know. It, no, no, it is important. I mean, it, it can be. You right? agree, I right, Chachun? I see you smiling. <laughs> I mean, I think it can be. You know, 
An Albani had like uh, that, uh, like uh, either tweeting or, or a piece out about the Town Policy Act. In my read of it, very little of the Town Policy Act was symbolic. Maybe the one that comes that is that stands out the most is the name change from TechRo to TRO. <laughs> uh, but things like Senate confirmation, for example, is actually quite important on the U.S. domestic side. I mean, what is considered symbolic versus what is considered substantive is often especially when people are calling something symbolic, they just mean like, I don't care about it. And I think it's stupid. They may exactly. not, I think the bigger question is, have they articulated a reason for why it's not substantively important? And so for example, when I, when I write about um, uh, the need for strategic clarity or the reason why Taiwan doesn't adopt like the uh, overall defense concept, well, part of the reason for that is symbolic but the it's it's about the fact that if the US isn't going to commit then the Taiwanese can't you know it's it's not going to, they're not going to be able to uh, uh, spend the political capital to to implement those things but even though the the cause may be symbolic it has extremely important substantive effects and that's where the the kind of rubber meets the road so that you know the, the reason why I'm like Tecro TRO I kind of don't care that much either way is just because I'm not sure what the ultimate substantive effect of that symbolic thing would be. However, something like Senate confirmation uh, or um, you know arm sales or things that could be seen to be symbolic, they will actually have a really substantive effect, and that is important. Uh, so I think that sort of cause and effect distinction is actually really critical in my mind. And oftentimes, the people who poo-poo symbolism don't really realize that there is that effect. But I think it's also incumbent upon us to emphasize what those effects are. And why it's in the U.S. interest to actually pursue those things? Yeah, very good. Thank you, Ray. Um, and uh, I think we uh, overextended our welcome. Is that how we say that? But um, <laughs> I, I, I thought it was a very important meeting we had, Ray. So thank you so much. And you know, we've done this with members of Congress, but that's you know, we learned, and I hope you learned. Oh. Uh, you know, both learned, and I look forward to continue to do this. Maybe at some point, a part two. Or maybe even a Quo Vanderwee's family <laughs> joint session mm -hmm. sooner rather than later, because I think this is all uh, very helpful. So let's give uh, Ray an, uh, a big round of applause. Let him go back to the slippery slopes <laughs> to his family. And means uh, unless there's anything else, I think we can uh, conclude this meeting as having been very successful. And we should do this more often. Can yes. I ask one quick thing here? Does mean means to you anything? We're fine, right, Minsa? We are good. We are good. Thank okay. you. Final yeah. word yeah. from Thomas. Could you ask your question? No, no, no substance anymore because we're we're done, <laughs> uh, Thomas. No, it's uh, to the headquarter. Okay. Yeah. Ask question. Last time we signed uh, up for that uh, dip diplomatic re uh, recognition, but yes. the progress. Uh, that's resolution House Concurrent Resolution 10, yes. which was introduced by Congressman Tom Tiffany, a Republican from Wisconsin. It has now 31 co-sponsors, and that's the most that resolution has ever received because we have introduced that resolution over the past pretty much close to two decades. And, um, you know, this is the, the, the most support it got. The unfortunate thing is that it got support from so far only Republicans. Right. And the more Republicans that join a resolution as co-sponsors, the lower the chance is that a Democrat will jump on. But the resolution, if it would pass, or because we have a Republican con uh, Congress at the moment, so you know, technically Mr. McCall should be able to mark it up if he cares deeply and pass it so that it goes to the floor if necessary. So that is possible. But the resolution is just a awareness resolution. Passing the resolution doesn't mean that we will have diplomatic relations between the United States and Taiwan. It's to build up momentum and to build up support for our dream of Taiwanese Americans that we want to have Taiwan uh, US diplomatic relations. But we continue to put, we have put a petition on our website. So visit that, fapa.org. Yeah, can I add on? Uh, is, is Ray already gone? I just don't. Ray's still here. Ray's oh, still, still here. Okay. 
Uh, I should get going soon. So. Okay, Ray, you go, you go, and do your. Uh... <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. you. Big round of applause and, uh... again, and we'll see you soon. And next time you're in DC, we get together for a pijo, Dutch <laughs> treat, <laughs> Dutch treat. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Um, Bye. Bye. Oyang wanted to ask something, right? Uh, yeah, I just yeah. want to. And <laughs> it's very important for you to spread this, uh, you know, uh, resolution ten. I submit, uh, you know, a few few days ago through our, you know, uh, website, and uh, we are in New York uh, District uh, 18. And yesterday I got a home call from his uh, foreign affairs aide. Unfortunately, I'm not able to to talk to her. You know, I was, you know, but he she gave a message, and she was a response, you know, to to my request, you know, about this uh, restoration. And he's a Democrat, and he's a fresh congressman. So I did this petition, you know. Uh, was quite powerful. So everybody should remind you a member, you know, your friend, you know, to submit those uh, petition, you know, through our, you know, FAPA website. That's just what I want to edit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Young. you and I already, yeah. You, we already communicated about that. That's Congressman Pat Ryan from New York, a Democrat from New York. And I will follow up with the office. West Point graduate. West Point graduate. Who doesn't mm -hmm. get any better than that? <laughs> um means uh, um do we have any household uh, housekeeping announcements i hope we will see everybody here in the room on may 1st in taipei right i want to see uh, everyone here john bolton taipei, has confirmed to be a speaker so i think that will attract some uh, attention right. um means uh, and we hope that people can buy tables sell tables buy seats but as long as we all have a happy family reunion in taipei on may 1st i think that will be a lot of fun right i i, I really am asking every one of us here uh try to sponsor a table have a table uh, or a few tickets that's all i think i'm asking and if you can be there in person that that'll be wonderful yeah thank you all right and thank you sue for uh 